Hey everyone, this is the first of a three-part series on numbers and the history of numbers. Now, we all think we know what numbers are because we meet them very early on in life when we talk to count, one, two, three, four, five, so on, okay? But when you start to think more about numbers, they're not as obvious as they first seem. You can't see, for example, the number four. You can see four sheep, you can see four oranges, for example. You can't see the number four. It's an abstract quantity. And as time went on, even more abstract numbers started to appear. For example, negative numbers, fractions, rational numbers, irrational numbers, the real numbers, imaginary numbers, complex numbers. And then beyond that, even stranger things like surreal numbers. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this series. Now, the first part will be on reasonably familiar ground with the counting numbers, the natural numbers. And then later on, we'll move on to these more esoteric things that I mentioned. So, let's discover the maths. In a remote Amazonian region of Brazil lives a tribe, the Paraha, whose couple of hundred members can't count beyond two. The word for one can also mean a few, while two does double duty as not many. Anything else is simply many. They also have no way of saying more, several, or all, which to us seems very strange. After all, it's normal for toddlers who've just turned two to be able to count to three, and a year later to be able to count to ten or more. But the Pirahas aren't stupid. They're hunter-gatherers who've no need to count, and so no need to practice doing it. American linguist Daniel Everett tried to teach the Pirahas some basic numeracy skills after they expressed concern that their lack of knowledge might make it easy for them to be cheated when trading with other tribes. After eight months' effort, however, not a single Piraha had learned how to count to ten, or even to add one and one. Both their culture and their previous experience left them totally unprepared to grasp even the rudiments of numbers. We're so used to numbers from an early age that we forget that there's nothing obvious about them. They're not like things, animals and people in the everyday world that parents can point out to their children and label flower, dog or eye. They're abstractions. And as the Piraha example shows, ones that are hard to grasp unless we're exposed to them from an early age, which most of us are. Even so, some numbers are easier to understand than others. A three-year-old, for example, if encouraged, might be able to count to ten or more, but probably doesn't have a real understanding for what numbers mean that are much larger than three. Adding comes a little later, fractions and how to deal with them follow, and finally we're introduced to the mysteries of working with negative numbers. None of these types of numbers are self-evident. Much less so are numbers that we never use in our day-to-day -day lives, and that many of us never study in school, so-called imaginary numbers, and beyond them, exotica, such as surreals and transfinites. Yet in maths, all these dwellers of the numerical cosmos are equally real and valid even though they may seem as unintelligible and irrelevant to most of us as 3, 4 and 5 are to the Amazonian hunter-gatherer. Quite early on in our schooling, we're introduced to the idea of the number line, starting from zero and extending in one direction towards bigger and bigger values. Then negative numbers are brought into the picture and we learn that the number line also extends the other way, as far as we care to go. The integers, positive and negative, and zero, quickly become concepts with which we're familiar and comfortable. How could they not be clear to everyone? Yet, for much of human history, the number line would have seemed completely alien. 
We don't know when numbers were first used. Some animals, including birds and rodents, can tell at a glance when one pile of objects is bigger than another. There's an obvious survival advantage in being able to do this, but it isn't the same as counting. To count, an animal would have to recognize at some level that each object in a collection corresponds to a single number and that the last number in a sequence represents the total number of objects. Research has shown that not only many primates have this innate ability, but so too do dogs. Animal behavior researchers Robert Young and Rebecca West carried out an experiment in 2002 using 11 mongrels and some dog treats. A few treats were put in a bowl in front of each dog and then a screen raised to block the dog's view. The dog then watched as some treats were taken away or added before the screen was lowered again. If the researcher surreptitiously took away or added more treats than was shown, the dog would stare at the bowl much longer, apparently aware that the sums didn't add up. Numerals, symbols for numbers, and rules for doing simple arithmetic followed the rise of the first civilizations in Sumer and other parts of Mesopotamia. But there's good evidence that people kept track of the number of things, though exactly what things isn't clear, much earlier in the form of tally sticks. The Labombo bone found in Border Cave in the Labombo Mountains bordering Swaziland and South Africa is a baboon fibula, at least 43,000 years old, on which 29 notches have been made. One theory is that it was used to keep track of the phases of the moon, in which case African women may have been the first mathematicians, because menstrual cycles are linked to the lunar calendar. Others dispute this, however, pointing out that the bone may have been broken and originally had more than 29 marks. It's also been suggested that the markings are purely decorative. More complex are the markings on another bone tool, the Ashango bone, found in 1960 near the Semliki River on the Uganda-Congo border and dating back perhaps 20,000 years or more. The exact interpretation of the Ashango notches is again a matter of debate, but some of the patterns hint at a surprisingly sophisticated knowledge of maths that would long predate civilization. The bone, another baboon fibula, has a series of notches carved in groups of three rows running the length of the bone. The markings on two of these rows each add to 60. The first row is consistent with a number system based on 10 since the notches are grouped as 20 plus 1, 20 minus 1, 10 plus 1, and 10 minus 1, while the second row contains the prime numbers between 10 and 20. A third seems to show a method for multiplying by 2 that was employed much later by the Egyptians. Whether these are mere coincidences we can't be certain, however, a second bone found a year earlier also bears a pattern of notches suggestive of an understanding of number and number bases. What we know for sure is that when people began to settle in towns and cities in the Middle East several thousand years BC, they had a need for numbers and began to develop ways to represent them and do basic operations with them, such as addition and subtraction. The need arose from trade and the importance of keeping accurate track of transactions. For example, if I agreed to give you 10 sheep as part of a deal, you had to be sure that I wasn't conning you by handing over only nine sheep. A reliable method of counting became essential because most of us can't immediately judge the difference between nine things and 10. Only through awareness and use of the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on, is this possible? At this stage, however, no one gave a thought as to what might come between or before these numbers. Earlier, before commerce and business appeared on the scene, 
natural numbers weren't a necessity. If I'm a shepherd with 10 or 20 sheep, it's not essential that I know the exact number. An approximate idea is good enough. It's only with the rise in importance of trade that the natural numbers became an indispensable part of our lives. To begin with, they took the form of sealed clay tokens, called bullae. But later a system of writing down numbers in a way similar to tally marks evolved. At this stage people still hadn't grasped the idea that numbers could be distinct from what was being counted, so that at first the number 10 say wasn't treated as an entity in itself, common to 10 sheep, 10 cows or 10 loaves of bread. The notion of natural numbers as having a separate existence from the collections of things they describe took time to develop, but when it did, it had a powerful effect on mathematics and how we think. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll check out my website www.daviddarling.info uh, where you can find details of all my books, including the latest, the Weird Math series. Please subscribe to this channel and I'll see you again very soon to discover more maths.